must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. My name is Brandon Pollan, and I'm joined for this episode by my fellow co-host, Dr. Stephanie Wyrock. And today, we welcome back Dr. Julie Whitman onto the show for an episode focusing on a relatively new DSC path authored, offered through Bellin College with Evidence in Motion. Now, for those who are not aware, Ju- Julie is the director of the Bellin College and Evidence and Motions Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapy Fellowship Program, along with the Evidence and Motion Post Professional DPT and Musculoskeletal Management. And I realize what everyone's probably realizing right now that, hey, yes, didn't you guys have Julie on before? Yes, we did. We did have her on to talk about her perspective of being a fellowship program director, along with discussing some fellowship issues. So please check our show notes for that episode if you haven't heard it and you want to take a listen to that. So it's there for you guys to listen to. Um, you know, but it's truly wonderful, Julie, to have you back on again. So thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show again. No, anytime. We'd love to have you on to talk about, about more stuff. And, you know, obviously, I'm sure a lot of stuff has changed or gone on with you since last time we've had you on. So, you know, what have you been up to since last we chatted to kind of just give an update? Yeah, well, uh, work-wise, um, I've been working a lot with uh, our assistant director of our fellowship program and the Bellin team and the EIM team to get ready to kick off our first cohort of fellows in training out of Bellin College. So they start in January. Um, We've also been transitioning our Evidence in Motion fellows in training from Evidence in Motion to Bellin College. And then uh, we're getting ready to start our first cohort of um, a blended learning DSC program to get these students started up in May. So um, it's, uh, it's fun. We have, uh, we're able to start up 20 students in May and uh, we're almost full. So that's a good problem to have. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you guys are having a lot of great success and that you've been busy. You know, uh, before we dive into this, let's give some context to our listeners. Can you tell us specifically what a DSC is and how it's different from a PhD or an EDD for terminal degrees? Yeah, um, you might get, as you might have guessed, you might get different answers really depending on who you ask or what country someone's from or what degree sort of they came from or institution they came from. Um, But in the U.S., these degrees are viewed as sort of roughly equivalent terminal degrees. Um, The Ph.D. can pertain to any uh, really chosen field. The DSC is really restricted to fields in science, obviously, based on the the name of the degree. An educational terminal degree is really focused in that, you know, specific area. Um, Specifically looking at, say, Ph.D. programs, you know, they often – the research you might do in that program could be in a foundational science area up to, you know, clinical application, et cetera. But the DSC typically focuses on um, more clinical application um, type of research. And obviously educational degrees would focus on educational research. And in the same way, the content that's contained in those programs is typically um, focused based on those bents. But in the PT profession, you know, these are all sort of qualified terminal degrees to really hold ranked faculty positions. Um, And they all give you the strong educational um, preparation for conducting and disseminating research and for, you know, entry into academics. Um, The other thing that 
comes up is this question about you know competition for grant funding, and there is um, certainly in the PT profession a like common held belief that these high dollar sort of grant programs are biased towards those with PhDs over maybe a DSC. Um, I'm not actually sure on the educational doctoral side, um, but strong research track records is, can certainly combat this. So think about people like Dan Rohn or maybe Lynn Snyder Mackler in the more orthopedic or sports related areas um, who both have uh, uh, scientific doctorates versus um, PhDs. Yeah. And, and Julie, you bring up a couple interesting points there. And one, I kind of want to get your thoughts on, because I know that there's been a lot of discussion on th what I'm about to ask specifically. So of course, you know, knowing that as it stands now for PT programs, CAPTI's requirement that programs have at least 50% of all faculty in a deep PT program, they must have a terminal academic degree. What are your thoughts on this specific number for this requirement? And what are some of the pros and cons that you think that this kind of a requirement has? Yeah, I, the first thing is I'm really I'm not directly teaching in a first professional program, but I certainly have an opinion on the topic. Um, generally speaking, I'm in support of dropping this requirement, which was certainly well intentioned at the time it was put in, but really I'm more in favor of adding language to the CAPT requirements that would require faculty to have a like a formalized clinical credential and or a post-professional graduate degree that's beyond entry level, that's relevant to the person's role in that educational program, and that requires some advanced education skill in that area's uh, person's like area of specialization. So you could think like fellowship level post-professional training, completion of specialized master's degrees maybe, or even certificates in relevant areas like business or nutrition or anatomy, statistics, maybe biomechanics. So the key is that each program, in my opinion, should be responsible for ensuring that there's like a breadth of knowledge on the faculty team that really meets expectations for the mission of that program and for that academic institution. So I'm not at all advocating um, an absence of commitment to scholarship, but I am advocating a shift to the programs of responsibility for overseeing how this all happens and then allow CAPTI to hold programs accountable for their outcomes without really micromanaging the process or pathway for how um, this actually is achieved. How did the idea of making a DSC transition come about? And, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure this was probably a complicated process, but what was the process to get this all started? Yeah, um, as you guys know, we've been uh, running this Evidence in Motion OMPT Fellowship for a decade now, and it's a three-year highly intensive program that really exceeds the expectations of like APTA, IFOMT, and AOMT, um, and in particular goes beyond the requirements of these um, regulatory organizations in the areas of like foundational knowledge, evidence-based practice information, mentorship, and professional leadership. Um, so a lot of our fellowship grads do move on to like leading in the clinical settings or starting their own practices, but a, a decent portion of our grads consistently have expressed a desire to get more involved in academics. Um, and they come up against this CAPT requirement that you guys brought up to have a terminal degree. So this has been a barrier for them and not having some form of terminal degree. Um, but they want to stay, you know, clinically focused and not necessarily pursue a PhD and a DSC is definitely more appealing for them. Um, and they also want to develop their understanding of academics and curricular aspects and leadership aspects for academics. Um, they also often say they want to get more involved in clinical research or even move on to be independent researchers. And so it's really the demand from our graduates and then the marketplace demand from the DPT programs that really drove us to push for this. Why did you guys choose Bellum College as the institution that would be sponsoring that degree? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, a lot of folks outside of uh, Wisconsin may not know of Bellin College, but they're actually this ideal partner for us. The college, are, they're focused on really promoting excellence in healthcare practice and advancing healthcare professions. The faculty and staff are like seriously good people. They work super hard to promote excellence. 
They've been a dream to work with all the way from um, the, the uh, president and CEO to the dean and all the faculty and staff. But they are also partnered with Bell & Health, which is a super high-speed healthcare system um, who we've had these long-term uh, colleagues and friendships over like now 20 years with therapists who are at Bell and Health. And Evidence in Motion has partnered with Bell and Health with the physical therapists for a long time in training up their clinicians um, in various post-professional training programs. So we've had this relationship for a long time, and then that branched out to connecting with Bell and College as well. And I guess the last thing is uh, Bell and Health is super organized, very streamlined um, in their care processes across all of their healthcare providers, and they have a very finely tuned EMR system, and they've been using photo for years. So like they're primed and ready to go to roll out a lot of clinical research. So, you know, across the board, the people, the systems in place, they're like the, honestly like the dream team for us. Yeah, I think that's really interesting to kind of get that perspective because honestly, when I had first heard it, I was like, I have never heard of Bell and College at all. So I have to research that more. And a lot of people actually in my cohort earlier as well, they had, they did they weren't familiar with it either. So I thought that was interesting. And it's good to kind of know. But I mean, I think once getting that understanding of kind of the behind the scenes and kind of what they do, I mean, it really does make sense to partner with them based on what you had said. And you know, obviously, you had kind of touched on this a little bit, Julie, in terms of what the process like was going through to make this whole thing a reality. So I'm curious because I'm sure this was a ton of work over a ton of time and probably a lot of frustration at times. Um, so what were and are the biggest barriers to making an option like this a reality to, you know, to really get this program off the ground? I think the biggest thing really was finding the right partner who really understood and embraced our vision. Um, and then you know, when you're working with a college that you're bringing in a higher level degree than they currently offer, clearly you need to go through the regional accreditation system. And so we went through the process of accreditation with the Higher Learning Commission. Um, but actually, I have to say that the process was a great experience and our site visitors were phenomenal. They gave us lots of words of wisdom and, and tips and pearls uh, to help us, you know, kick off smoothly. So, um, even though it was a long process, it's actually been a very, um, I don't know, uh, enjoyable process. I think it's really awesome that you guys have found such a great partner and have really been strategic with who you've partnered with for this. Tell us a little bit about what the DSC program with Bell and College specifically looks like and how it's broken down. So there's a couple things to think about. First of all, the uh, DSC program um, is in combination with our OMPT fellowship, so with our manual therapy fellowship. So the manual therapy fellowship is really part one towards completion of the DOCSI. So it's embedded within the DOCSI. So there are 55 credits that are in our manual therapy fellowship, and then there's DSC specific coursework that follows completion of fellowship. So once our uh, graduates are entering, once they enter the DSC specific coursework, they have 25 more credits. So it's three, uh, or sorry, two three credit courses in biostatistics, five two credit uh, research methodologies and doctoral project courses, and three three credit courses that are focused on uh, curricular design, curricular assessment evaluation, and leadership in higher ed. And from a research perspective, you know, the students in our fellowship um, now are required to complete a case report. And when they get into the DOCSI, they work in teams of two to conduct a systematic review, and then in teams of up to four to five to conduct a substantial research study. Um, but while the students get to work in teams to get high quality research done, they actually defend the projects individually in their final defense. Um, and then they are expected, obviously, to submit for publication and present their work at conferences. Um, they also go through a portfolio uh, review process, so they need to show um, expertise and examples of um, work in the areas of teaching, leadership, and research, because we really want to focus on all of these areas. Uh, students can get through this program in two and a half years. That's the fastest you could get through it, but you have to be done within five um, and now I mentioned that you, you know, that's, it's a two-step process, but 
PTs who are graduates from other credentialed fellowship programs, OMPT fellowship programs, can actually um, apply and enter into the DOCSI specific portion of the program to get their DSC. Um, and in that process, we do a review of their coursework from their fellowship program, uh, see if there's any sort of uh, areas that we cover in our fellowship that they didn't have in theirs that they might need to take, like, so for example, pain sciences or some coursework in evidence-based practice. So if they need to take anything that was in our fellowship program that wasn't in theirs, we add that in, and then they move into the doc size specific portion of the program. So um, our goal is to really be inclusive of uh, people who have finished other fellowship programs as well in OMPT currently. Nice. And, you know, and Julie, I, I got to be honest, one of the first things that at least initially kind of came to my mind, and I'm sure it comes to a lot of other people's mind as well, um, just due to the fact that, of course, finances are an aspect that do need to be considered, especially with, you know, DPTs going through, you know, school and then coming out with the debt loads. What is the total cost for this program? And are there options for financial assistance through it? Yeah. So um, our fellowship alone is right around 16000 So it's I'm sure you're aware that's fairly competitive with other programs. The DSC specific component that's a, the add-on component after fellowship is $22,000, um, which if you, you know, at first you might have no comparison really to other programs, but it is a pretty uh, streamlined um, amount of coursework and uh, pretty streamlined from a cost perspective as well if you look at other PhD and DSC programs. Um, yes, and then financial assistance, yes. So students are or may be eligible for um, federal financial loans or private educational loans. Um, we are an institution that will allow uh, individuals to use their VA benefits or you know, GI Bill funding. Um, and also the bursar at the university um, is definitely someone who works with students for individual payment plans if they need to. So there's lots of opportunity for uh, funding. I know that this is a pretty new program, so and you've done a great job, Julie, describing um, coursework and uh, how the program came to be. But are there any other details regarding this DSC option that you guys are still working on since it is such a new program? Yeah, I mean, there's still, um, you know, courses that we don't have uh, every T crossed and I dotted on our learning management system. So we're, we're finalizing the courses. Um, for the research curriculum and for the uh, leadership and teaching courses. Um, and then the other piece that uh, Dan Roan, uh, who's the research director, and then the assistant research director, Jody Young, that they're working on is um, they're working to really strategize and work with their network of um, researcher sort of colleagues in the profession to set up maybe not fully fleshed out projects up front, but to really get everything primed and ready to go so that when students enter um, and they're setting up the research committees and they're setting, you know, designing what is the research question, uh, what line of inquiry are they going to pursue, that all the pieces are ready to go and quick to assemble and roll out. Gotcha. And, you know, Julie, something I'm just kind of curious about, because obviously Bellin is one example of this, but do other fellowship programs or even DPT schools, for that matter, have terminal degree transition options as well? And, and if there are, would you mind letting our audience know some of the other potential options for kind of another route if they wanted to look into that, at least for consideration? Yeah, I mean, the area that I'm, I'm the most tuned into is really where OMPT fellowships are partnered um, with DSC programs. And there are three, three others out there. So there's the U.S. Army Baylor program. There's uh, the NIOPT OMPT fellowship that's partnered with Andrews University. And then the uh, IAOM or the International Academy of Orthopedic Medicine that's partnered with Texas Tech University. Um, and all of these programs are really excellent. They have top-notch faculty, strong curricula, but each program only allows students to transfer in credits from their respected, uh, respective partnered fellowship programs. And then the Army Baylor obviously only allows uniformed service members to attend. So that's where we really saw this need to develop something that's really highly collaborative with other programs so we can 
really get more people through this process uh, with the goal of like infiltrating formal academics with really laser sharp clinicians who are trained up to that next level. As you mentioned a little earlier, Julie, you know, you said that one of the kind of issues with creating this 50% terminal degree rule um, from CAPD is that there's a lack of a uh, number of people that have these terminal degrees. So what advice would you maybe give to other fellowship programs looking to help solve this program or this problem and create a terminal degree option for their fellows? Yeah, I think one is uh, plan ahead because obviously the process takes a while if you need to go through an accreditation process. Um, find a great partner who has both this academic arm in that college or university, but who also is partnered with a strong clinical institution. And I think my opinion is this, this creates a real win-win situ you know, situation. Um, the, the other thing I would say is for fellowship programs, um, sometimes you don't need to recreate the wheel, wheel that um, we are definitely open to partnering and working with uh, other organizations. So that's an option as well. Very good. And, you know, Julie, I know last time we had you on the show, I was really kind of going through and getting your perspective as a fellowship program director, you know, and I'm just kind of curious to give our listeners maybe a little bit of an update on that realm. Have there been any new and upcoming changes to fellowship program requirements that have kind of happened since we last chatted? Yeah, this this could easily go to probably an hour long discussion in and of itself. <laughs> we won't take it that far. There's definitely some hot issues right now. And probably the primary focus is um, some policy that the ABPTRFE is will begin implementing as of January 1st, 2019, with a real focus on uh, what's called substantive change implementation 13.4.2. But Bottom line is um, there's processes in place when you bring on uh, new clinical sites, whether someone's in clinical practice at a site or receiving mentoring at a site, to go through sort of approval for that site. And there's been some changes with that process that would force programs to have live on-site site visits at a very high frequency. So the, the individual programs that this really hits are blended learning model focus residencies and fellowships. Um, and specifically, you know, the, um, this will drive a real inordinate amount of on, uh, on-site visits with cost of dollars, cost of time, um, and people actually can't afford it. And it just keeps draining away from time that we, and money that we should be using to teach and mentor. Um, so, you know, as you guys are aware, like blended learning has been embraced by the world, by the medical community, by other healthcare professions, higher academic, you know, sort of institutions across the globe. But a lot of these policies seemingly over the last decade and certainly now um, seem to sort of work strongly against blended learning programs. Um, and the tough thing is if these policies that are about to go into place are really unchecked, you could potentially lose, you know, at least in the OMPT fellowship world, potentially over half of the available spots for training. And it'll hit orthopedic residencies sort of equally hard. Um, so the APT on one side is saying, hey, we want to stay on a growth path, grow residencies and fellowships. On the flip side, the policies are really driving costs so high that we just can't do it. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens, but there's a big disconnect here that has to be addressed. And uh, certainly I'd love to hear you guys interview more people on this topic, you know, thinking about like Steve McDavid, Elaine Lahneman, Joe Donnelly, Cameron McDonald, Matt Haberl, you know, there's plenty of folks that would be great to get their opinion on this because it's going to create a lot of turmoil here in pretty quick order. True. But I mean, I think it's a discussion that needs to take place. And I think that obviously getting perspectives from every avenue here is really essential because, you know, obviously, I mean, I guess from one point, it could make sense. Like that was the reasoning behind this is what they wanted to do. But then it ended up morphing and there were kind of some unintended consequences that kind of got, that kind of went with it that do need to be brought up. And, you know, I'm curious, Julie, I'm going to ask you one follow up here. What do you see as it stands now? 
Do you feel like this issue is going to change significantly in the near future? That's a tough one. I mean, you know, I guess what really has to happen come January is either programs comply and go under and can't continue to exist and we lose all those slots and everybody's hard work and, you know, great programs that are rigorous that produce good, a good product. Um, we lose them all and then deal with the consequences of that, you know, or a mass group of programs decide to walk away from the credentialing process. Um, so we'll see. It should be interesting anyways. Yeah, that'll be definitely really interesting to see what happens for sure. Kind of like the Wild West here, I'm sensing. <laughs> That's what I get the feeling of too. Holy Wild West. You know, on our show, Julie, we have our final question, which you're familiar familiar with. We ask everyone if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, PT or otherwise, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? And on the previous episode that you were on, your answer was having more multidisciplinary exposure very early in professional education and repeated exposure that's formalized in post-professional education. Now that we know what your number one is, I want to ask you the same question as to what you, the second aspect of healthcare education that you would want to change would be. Yeah, well, my, my answer here is probably beating a dead horse in uh, professional discussions right now. Like this idea of we can't keep adding and driving required education and, you know, just burying our professionals with ridiculous amounts of debt burden. Um, so we need to provide first and post-professional level education at lower costs. How do you do it? You know, a lot of people don't like looking at how you do it. One of the key ways to do it is shorten training at where you can. Um, and we've got to tap technology, which I alluded to a little bit before, is, you know, technology lets us educate and train people in rural areas, but easier. Allows us to tap global expertise in educating students at a low cost. Allows us to mentor people from afar in some instances. Allows for greater educational standardization, or at least the potential for it. Lowers costs. We still obviously need one-on-one -on -one mentorship in the clinic in front of patients, you know, when it's the right time. We still need, you know, one-on-one -on -one or, or group in, in the flesh anyway, skills development and time for, you know, in the flesh for professional indoctrination. But that all needs to be really targeted. And we need to get smart with what we're doing so that we can cut this cost burden and allow people to move on to residency training, allow them to move on to fellowship training without having to threaten their very livelihood of like food on the table and paying their bills to make it happen. Yeah. And, you know, and Julie, I'm kind of just because I know, obviously, this is a huge topic and this is one that's come up multiple times on the show, you know, and obviously the two year model is something that, you know, seems to be gaining more ground lately. I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, why do you think that there is lack of willingness to maybe go more towards that avenue on a grand scale? And, you know, what do you feel like some of the barriers are to that? I mean, one big barrier is just people don't change quickly. You know, you, with, with all change, you have early adopters, right? And often early adopters are, are mocked and challenged, you know, ex, ex, extensively. Um, and then slowly but surely, every momentum starts. People see that the, the change was a good change. And then all of a sudden, there's a lot of momentum and everybody's jumping on board. And uh, I think we've been in that sort of, uh, challenging and, and sometimes mocking phase and now good products are being realized and uh, now we're shifting where we're getting other people really getting on board or at least talking about it. So I, I think it's going to shift actually pretty rapidly, but I think it's resistance to change as a primary reason. All right. Well, then Julie, we kind of have one more follow-up that we kind of have been kind of adding new to the show here a little bit here. So I kind of want to kind of dive in and ask you this, this big one here. So we know that we have a lot of newer professionals that are listening to the show, whether that be students, early year clinicians. And, you know, we kind of just like to ask, what advice would you give to someone just starting their career? So I would say the first thing is to keep learning. You know, a lot of folks will get out of their first professional program, start working, 
And in today's day and age, especially with the documentation and all of, you know, healthcare's sort of um, burden when it comes to uh, make, you know, making sure you cross all the T's and all I's, people get buried pretty quickly. Um, and then stop engaging in the learning process. Clearly, you're, you're learning from your patients every day, but additional learning, reading articles, working with colleagues, going to courses, because it keeps you fresh and it keeps you engaged and excited. Um, pursuing, I think, residencies and fellowships is particularly smart uh, to do because any sort of standardized track is going to keep you on a good learning curve and sort of hit that fast forward button for you. Um, the other piece that I think is huge is find professional mentors. Find a, a couple of folks that you want to look like when you, <laughs> you grow up or then five years from now or 10 years from now and just latch onto them and just suck up any sort of mentorship that they're going to you know, provide for you. Well, I know. I think that's a really, really good answer. And I think that's helpful to a lot of the newer professionals there because only being a three-year clinician myself, I can certainly vouch that those are some very, very good tips there, Julie. Um, now, of course, understanding that, you know, if people want to, people might have more questions kind of related to um, the program or anything like that. But where can people like find out more about the program or kind of ask a question about the program? Should they kind of have one? Yeah, so the best place to start is at the Bellin College uh, website, um, and I can get you a link for that. The other is you can reach out to me at julie.whitman at bellincollege.edu um, or to John Weiss, who is our on-site um, program coordinator at Bellin College. So that's J-O-N dot Weiss, W-E-I-S-S -S, at bellincollege.edu. Well, perfect, Julie. And again, thank you so much for your time, for coming on again and for providing some great insight. I think it's, you know, it's really, I'm, I'll be admonest, I'm biased because I'm part of the fellowship program, but it's really quite an amazing program. And I'm really excited to kind of see this next thing take off here. So thank you for all that you do for the program and the profession. It's, it's really, truly remarkable. You bet. Thanks a lot. It's been a fun journey so far. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.